Hello and welcome back to my series of videos on the science of evolution. My name is Tony B and this is another soundbite, a small diversion away from some of my main topics. Please take time to view some of the main topics I cover in this series, such as explaining carbon-14 dating, redshift, and looking at how the dog evolved from an extinct wolf creature, our relatedness to other human groups such as Neanderthals, and the evidence for deep time. Now, creationists will never give a definitive definition answer to the question, what a kind is. They will make reference to their Bible and state that they are the original forms of life as created by their God. So let us test that assertion. The horse is a kind and the donkey is a kind, but scientifically a different species. The horse has 64 chromosomes. The donkey has 62 chromosomes. However, within the science of evolution, they do share a common ancestor. Shall we say an original created kind? And this allows them to interbreed, despite the fact they are a different species. The result of their interbreeding is a mule. The mule has 63 chromosomes and cannot produce offspring. They cannot bring forth. Creationists stated that a kind must be able to bring forth the same kind. However, we know that this is not correct as mules are the same kind but cannot bring forth the same kind. This one example proves an evolutionary relationship between horses and donkeys which allows interbreeding between species and also proves that not all kinds can bring forth. But why would the Bible make such an error? Well, it could be due to the fact that ancient nomads who contributed much of the material contained within this mythical book had no understanding of chromosomes and genetic science. Creationists will accept new varieties within a species. For example, microevolution as identified within the evolution of the dog from a now extinct wolf-like creature. But they won't accept a new species from an original kind. This is called macroevolution. For example, a bird kind from a dinosaur kind. However, going back to our horse and donkey reference, as long as a species can reproduce, as long as genes can mutate, as long as they are subjected to selection, species will continue to diverge. I would like you to consider two ape species, the gibbon and the siamang. Scientists place them in different genera of the same family. They live together in Southeast Asia, but are not known to interact. The gibbon has 22 pairs of chromosomes. The siamang has 25 pairs. Their chromosome banding patterns have been so extensively rearranged that only one chromosome still bears a recognizably similar banding pattern in both species. Their genetic identity, genes coding for essentially identical proteins, is 0.76. No natural hybrids have been reported born in the wild. Their separation into different genera seems morphologically and behaviorally justified. However, Despite these facts, they are genetically closely related as most rodent species belonging to one genus. As far as chromosomes are concerned, they are as closely related as domestic dogs and the red fox. Therefore, scientists view these observations as strong evidence for a close evolutionary relationship, evidence that they share a common ancestor. Since 1975, two hybrids have been born in the Atlanta Zoo. 
This is an image of a Gibbon Siamang hybrid. This evidence unquestionably confirms that Gibbons and Siamangs are highly modified descendants of a recent common ancestor. Now, this is the thing. This evidence supports an evolutionist position, but creationists also accept the evidence. So, let us now apply these same principles to another pair of mammal species, and let us see if creationists and evolutionists continue to agree. And for now, let us keep the identity of these mammals secret. The two mammal species that I'm talking about share a genetic identity that is 0 0.70, about equal to what we witnessed between the gibbon and the siamang. However, and this is important, unlike the gibbon and the siamang, the chromosomes of these two mammals are virtually identical. Even though one species has one pair of chromosomes more than the other. The banding sequences are mostly in the same locations in the two chromosome sets. But in one species, nine short segments are inverted. 18 chromosomes have other minor changes, and one long chromosome has split to form two short ones, accounting for the different number of chromosomes. No hybrids have been found in nature. This is the same as gibbons and siamangs. However, unlike the gibbon and the siamang, no one has reported producing a hybrid from these two mammals in a confined scientific experiment, such as in a zoo or in a laboratory. If the proven criteria for genetic relatedness as accepted by creationists are objectively applied, then these two mammal species are merely one more example of variation within a created kind. If I was talking about horses or dogs, creationists would not have an issue. But the two species I am talking about are Homo sapiens and chimpanzees. This video is not just about chromosome 2, it is also about relatedness, our relatedness with our nearest relative, the chimpanzee. If you compare the genetic sequence identity, comparing the genetic code of adenine, cytosine, guanine and thymine of the chromosome, we find that humans are more similar to chimpanzees than any other living mammal. That is a fact. Just look at this image of our genetic similarity with chimpanzees. It is undeniable. We are related and therefore we must share a common ancestor. And so we now come to human chromosome 2 and the arguments from creationists that this does not prove relatedness or a common ancestor. Homo sapiens have 23 pairs of chromosomes, giving us 46 chromosomes. Chimpanzees and all other great apes have 24 pairs, giving them 48. Human chromosome 2 is the result of two ancestral ape chromosomes fused at their telomeres. The major structural difference is that human chromosome 2 is derived from two smaller chromosomes that are found in other great apes, now called 2A and 2B. When ancestral chromosome 2A and 2B fused to produce human chromosome 2, no genes were lost from the fused ends of 2A and 2B. At the site of fusion, there are approximately 150,000 base pairs of sequences not found in chimpanzee chromosome 2A and 2B. Additional linked copies of PGML, FOXD, CBWD genes exist elsewhere in the human genome, 
particularly near the P end of chromosome 9. This suggests that a copy of these genes may have been added to the end of the ancestral 2A or 2B prior to the fusion event. So let us sum up the evidence that humans and chimpanzees are related and therefore share a common ancestor and how a mutation found in chromosome 2 caused two chromosomes to fuse into one. The chimpanzee has nearly identical DNA sequences to human chromosome 2, but they are found in two separate chromosomes. A vestigial centromere has been identified. Normally, a chromosome has just one centromere, but in chromosome 2, there are remnants of a second centromere in the Q21.3 and Q22.1 regions. The presence of vestigial telomeres contribute to this evidence. These are normally found only at the ends of a chromosome, but in chromosome 2, there are additional telomere sequences in the Q13 band, far from either end of the chromosome. Creationists argue that an active gene is located at the chromosome 2 fusion site. Therefore, the whole chromosome 2 fusion is falsified. However, what they fail to state is that this is not a regular active gene. It is a pseudogene, DDX11L2. It is one of a collection of 18 copies of DDX11L2 scattered around the human genome. All but one of these are found adjacent to telomeres. But the one adjacent to the fusion site mentioned is in the middle of the chromosome. Remember this, in the middle of the chromosome, further evidence of a fusion. Also, right next to the copy of DDX11L2 adjacent to the fusion site is the gene WASH. This is also adjacent to copies of DDX11L2 wherever they appear on the opposite side of the telomere sequence. Creationists also state that there are not as many telomeres or copies of the TTAGGG sequence on either side of the fusion site as on the ends of most chromosomes. But this is actually consistent with the fusion hypothesis because it has long been noted that chromosomes that have lost telomeres in the process of cell divisions are actually more prone to fusion. Creationists also argue that the TTAGGG sequence and their complements spanning the fusion site have a few errors, insertions and deletions. But this again is consistent with the mutations in the several million years since the fusion event. Science has proved the evidence that the chromosome 2 fusion supports all the other genetic evidence that the closest living relative to Homo sapiens is the chimpanzee. We are indeed related and we did indeed share a common ape ancestor. There are a number of creationist sites on the web which are desperately trying to debunk this genetic evidence of our relatedness to chimpanzees and the sharing of a common ancestor especially in evidence such as the human chromosome 2 fusion. For example, in Answers in Genesis, which is known for its misinformation and intellectual dishonesty, there is a lengthy rebuttal by a creationist geneticist named Jeffrey Tompkins. His biggest claim is that at the alleged site on human chromosome 2, where the fusion occurred, there is a functioning gene, rather than the remnants of fused telomeres. But that is incorrect. As biologist Kenneth Miller states, 
the fusion site is more than 1,300 bases away from the gene. And as a geneticist, Tompkins would know this. At the start of this video, I demonstrated how creationists will accept the relationship between Gibbons and Siamangs because it does not challenge their religious beliefs. However, despite the overwhelming genetic evidence, they continue to deny such a relationship between Homo sapiens and chimpanzees. And part of that evidence is the chromosome 2 fusion. Do you think that this could be a case of double standards? Anyway, thank you for taking the time to view this video. I hope it has provided you with some food for thought on the subject of evolutionary science. And if you've enjoyed it, please take some time to view my other videos in this series. But for now, I would like to wish everyone good health and happiness. And until next time, goodbye.